freshman seminar entitled Blessed Unrest. I am Eileen Gray. I'm an instructor in the nursing department. And with joining me today from the biology department are Drs. Ching Ching Chao and Dr. Jameson Chase. And we're going to speak to you from our scientific perspective in what we see in the book Blessed Unrest. My first disclaimer, as my nursing students who are here know, that this is the end of laryngitis. So if you are, well, how many here are nursing students? Okay, I really don't sound like this, right, Rachel? Yeah. So I'm going to begin today by talking to you about Blessed Unrest, which is a book that you have all read by Paul Hawkins. Blessed Unrest is about the largest movement in the world and how this movement came into being. It is about people. We are people, and how people like us can change the world. Is it, it is about those who protest labor injustices, who support local farming, who, who defend people in their native countries, indigenous people in other countries, which is part of my talk today. This global humanitarian movement works from the bottom up. It only takes one of us to make a change in the world. It is centered in three basic areas, environmental activism, social justice initiatives, and working with indigenous cultures in their resistance to globalization. This movement expresses the needs of the majority of people on earth <coughs> excuse me, to sustain the environment, to wage peace throughout the world, to democratize decision-making and policies to improve the lives of women, of children, and of the poor. It is about social justice. It is about human rights. So how do we, sitting in this room, achieve this kind of a daunting task? I have a mirror hanging in my office, as my nursing students will tell you, that says, it is by seeing within that one changes one's outer vision. It is by knowing who we are within ourselves and what we can do as one person and how we can change the world. Paul Hawkins says, what we already know frames what we see, and what we see frames what we understand. At the heart of all of these things that I'm talking to you about today is relationships. It's about tens of millions of people working towards restoration and towards social justice. It is with the power of one person, as I will describe to you. It is about paying it forward. It is about the exponential change that we can create as a group of dedicated people. I'll talk to you first about the power of commitment. Any of you who know about history have probably heard of Ernest Shackleton. He was a great explorer. He had dreams of be being the first person to cross the Antarctic on foot. This journey of explanation, uh, exploration would become a 20-month odyssey for him and his crew, a 20-month odyssey of survival. Staying alive required courage, ingenuity, and his leadership. Ironically, his ship was named the Endurance, and as you can see by the photo, the ship was caught in an ice floe and was completely destroyed. They were only 100 miles from their destination. The ship was crushed, and the crew passed a very bitter winter in the desolate Antarctica. He and part of his crew eventually made it to a whaling island and were able to send a rescue mission to get the rest of his crew. So now I would ask you, what does an adventure story like this have to do with social justice and human rights? <coughs> well, I believe that like Shackleton, those who fight for the rights of others and the environment have a, an, have a desire to conquer. Excuse me. <coughs> we want to conquer the inequities in this world. We can conquer the inequities in this world with leadership and with commitment. All it takes is the power of one individual who has a vision to change. I'm going to talk to you next about the power of one. Doctors Without Borders 
is an international medical humanitarian organization of nurses and of physicians. They work in more than 60 countries to assist people whose survival is threatened by violence, by neglect, and by catastrophe. While this organization was formally organized in 1971, it began in 1968 with the famine in Biafra. It now serves over 60 countries. It was started by one. Operation Smile was founded in 1982 by a plastic surgeon and his wife. Nurses and physicians, again, are part of Operation Smile. They go to various countries throughout the world to primarily perform surgeries on children with severe facial deformities. The picture you see at the bottom of this slide, for those of you who are about to enter nursing and others, is a picture of a little girl who had a severe facial deformity called the cleft palate and cleft lip. What you see on the right was what Operation Smile was able to achieve for her and her family. I've been involved with an organization in the United States side of the organization called Physicians for Peace. This organization was founded, founded in 1984 by one man, Charles Horton. It has been said about Dr. Horton that his strength was his ability to take a single problem and distill it down to its most basic element and then figure out how to solve it. What could be more basic for all of us than to build world peace, just one friendship at a time? Physicians for Peace have completed over 200 missions, sending nurses, sending physicians to countries in the Middle East, <coughs> Central America, South Africa, Eastern Europe, and eight parts of Asia. The photo that you see here on the slide was a mission that the physician I work with was at last year in the Middle East. These people waited for some 18 hours a day, many days in a row, with the hope that their child, their one child, would be fortunate enough to get the surgery that would be needed. As Dr. Bill first said, global health is the currency of peace. There are just these that I've mentioned are a few of the humanitarian efforts that are in place. If we think of ways that we as U.S. citizens, indeed, we are Western world citizens, we can improve our image in other countries, in other corners of the globe. Anne Frank once said, how wonderful it is that nobody need to wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Mother Teresa said, people are often unreasonable, but forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of self selfish ulterior motives, but be kind anyway. If you are honest and frank, you may be cheated. People may cheat you, but be honest and be frank anyway. If you find serenity and you find happiness, people will be jealous, be happy anyway. The good you did today will often be forgotten tomorrow. Do it anyway. Give the world the best that you have. In the final analysis, it's really between you and God. It was never about all of them. I have now spoken to you about the power of commitment, about the power of one. And now I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes about the power of a team a team of dedicated people who came together in 2008 and said we, here at South Virginia University, can make a change in the world. In 2008, the nursing department here at this university sought to change the lives of the indigenous people in a country in South America called Belize. In Belize, as you can see, the life expectancy is only 67 years. A long way off for most of you, but not for some of us. In Belize, there are only 17 nurses for every 10,000 people. Yet they manage to provide the most basic of health care 
for the most basic of human needs. In just one year, between 2008 and 2009, the dedicated students and faculty here at Salve Regina University were able to gain the trust of the medical and the nursing community in Louise City. We've received donations in kind from companies, including shoes and clothing. On my trip to Belize in 2008, I found that the entire nursing community for the University of Belize probably had less textbooks than each one of you have or will have at the end of this four years in your bookcase. We undertook a campaign with some of our publishers and had donated over 80 nursing textbooks, current editions, to donate to the nurses in Belize. We also have received donations of mannequins, because in Belize there is no man for the nursing students to practice. There is no lab. There is no facility. Last year, we conducted the first annual symposium for the nurses in Belize City. And this year, we are working with Newport Hospital to have the nursing medical conferences and grand rounds telecasted directly to Belize City. We work in various places in Belize, including private hospitals, public hospitals, daycare centers, orphanages. We work with children with AIDS, and we work in children's homes. So as I come to a close here in my next few slides, I have a few thoughts. As was stated by Paul Hawkins, what will guide us is a living intelligence that creates miracles every second, carried forth by a movement with no name. In the top left picture on this slide is Miss Viola. When I met her, she had been in debt on her back for three months. She was 104 years old. Her wish for the people in Belize, she had two wishes. Her wish for the people in Belize would be improved health care, and she wanted to live to 105. She died three weeks after her 105th birthday. So I say to you that the power of one, the power of commitment, the power of a few, the power of a team can change the world. We've proved it here. We are proving it here at Salve Regina University. I would be remiss if I did not close my humanitarian talk without talking about the United States, because charity begin at home. There are people who are in need right here in America. Last year, the alternate spring break was to New Orleans to help in the continued efforts after Hurricane Katrina. This year, students will travel to New York and work with the New York City Food Bank, working in soup kitchens. The challenges that are confronting our healthcare delivery system in the United States are well documented. We know that our medically indigent population here in the U.S. is growing. We know that there is unacceptable racial and ethnic disparities that persist on a number of key health areas and key health status indicators. We know that we are engaged in an escalating struggle to finance our own health care system here in America. There are those in urban and rural communities across this country who do not have adequate health care. I work with the school system in Central Falls. There are people in an urban community, a city that is one square mile, where many of the children do not eat from when they leave school on Friday until they return on Monday. They not only are lacking adequate health care, they are lacking food, and they are lacking the most basic of supplies. School feeds them, school provides clothes for them. Many of their parents are illegal immigrants, which is why they cannot get food stamps or aid from the country. These are issues in our own country, indeed in our own state, that also need our help. So I will close by saying that human suffering <coughs> does not recognize political boundaries. We are one people sharing one planet we have a moral responsibility to help each other. We are now, more than ever, one world. 
all people, all institutions, commerce, government schools and churches, need to learn from life and reimagine the world from the bottom up, from the power of commitment, from the power of one, from the power of a team, from the power of we the people. Based, this needs to be based first on the principles of justice and ecology. It is now my pleasure to turn the mic over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ting Ting Cha, who will continue to speak to you from her aspect as a scientist <coughs> about blessed unrest.
how we see this world, the earth condition. Okay. So we will see and there's uh, the blessed blessed unrest also talk a lot about it. We have seen this extreme poverty and we see all the waste we generate and we want we're going to talk a little bit more about those things. And the overcrowding and we have the deforestation and habitat loss. So we create quite a few problems. And we have air pollution and water pollution and we have climatic change. In case you don't know and if you want to learn more about those, we have uh, human and environment course created by Dr. Chase, very popular, filled up every semester. So that's how we see and environmental <coughs> science we usually look at those problems mostly on the kind of a, you know specialize. You specialize air pollution, you specialize water pollution and you try to understand and what is caused and how to figure out and how to solve the problem, right? But less unrest suggests a little bit different approach called systematic. So Earth it's a little bit like a big organism. And now it's ill. It's a ill, sick, critically sick organism. And the problem is systematic. It's not just this problem or that problem. It's many, many problems interrelated. And so, uh, in case you haven't um, figured out what this figure, the first is the ill, and this is the organism. And this is the thermometer. Running a fever. <laughs> okay, and, and it's maybe maybe it's one blue, I don't know. But. <laughs> Thank you. 
funds to say a lot is those NGOs. Each person can join those NGOs and we can do something. And something is more bottom up, not top down. So we people <coughs> bottom, we understand our situation. And we will have more realistic problem folks, uh, solutions. And problem folks means whatever problem you have and see the big picture of that. So if you have a global warming, then you maybe have to have an international, uh, you know, that kind of solution. And we have to have intelligent activities, recognize positive and negative. So in our class, we always talk about positive and negative. That's any solution we have. That's a totally positive or totally negative. No, that's not, we, we couldn't find it. So how do we choose that? We choose something more positive and less uh, negative. So we uh, encourage you guys to, we should join this immune system. We all become part of immune system. We can act in individual level, community level, and national level, international level. Depends where you are. And at least we will all can work on two levels, community and individual, to do better. sustainability, that's what Paul Hawken is talking about in his book. It's about sustainability, sustainable development, 
going back to a term that was coined in 1987 about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, that's a daunting goal in itself. But to think forward many generations as to what other people are going to need so that we're not over-consuming those resources and creating some of those wastes that Dr. Chow was just modeling for us. In fact, this has become an important aspect of your own university where in April of 2007, the Board of Trustees signed on to an agreement, an environmental sustainability agreement for the university. Uh, we're one of just a few universities uh, in the United States that has a sustainability statement that's as strong as the one that we have. And let me just highlight a couple of things about this statement just so you're aware. <coughs> one of the things, I'm pulling this directly from the statement, it says the university will strive to conduct its activities in an ecologically sound, socially just, and economically viable manner. And will continue to do so for those future generations. Of course, the, uh, the economically viable part has just gotten a bit more challenging, but uh, the university is, this is what they're striving for, okay? This is what we're trying to do. Uh, it'll support the concepts of sustainability, both in the coursework, the research, related activities, Preparing all members of the community to contribute to an environmentally sound and socially just society, fitting within our mission. <clears throat> Striving to function as a sustainable community, our own community, both as a campus and in the greater Newport community, um, trying to embody responsible consumption, promoting ecological literacy, and environmentally sound practices, all of us including our graduates. Some of you may already have this sticker on your own dorm room. Does anybody have that sticker yet? Good for you. Excellent. Hopefully the rest of you will join on and pledge to have a green room and begin to take some things on. We're working on an initiative now to, to uh, have our faculty sign on for a green office room. So the idea that we can take these things on, we can look at these global problems that seem so large and so beyond what we can do and just turn in and, as Dr. Gray pointed out, look in the mirror and think about what we can do ourselves and take those steps on our own uh, and collectively we will begin to see some change. As a scientist, as, a, as an ecologist, then I look at the, this mission that we have, I look at our sustainability policy, I look at these this ecological crisis, and I asked, what can I do with my science? How can I apply my science towards better stewardship, and how can I involve students in that? And I, I point out this picture to start with. This is a graduate of ours, Dan Pellis, from a couple of years ago, but our students are still uh, doing this. We are um, working with a group called Clean Ocean Access, and we are uh, monitoring the quality of our local water environment, where people go out and surf and swim and recreate, and we're, mo we're monitoring that for um, bacteria, primarily the fecal coliform that gets into the water and then causes people to get sick. There's an ecological problem there which relates to, to human health. And uh, our students have been out every Thursday morning at 7 o'clock. We go out and collect our samples as part of a large monitoring effort. This has turned into something a little bit bigger and more involved in the university, and we've gone a little bit beyond clean ocean access, and I'll talk a little bit about the Aquidneck Island Watershed Council, which is now beginning with our students to look at where our fresh water comes from and protecting our fresh water supply. This ties into my own background with studies of birds. I'm an, an ecologist, but primarily I study birds and trying to work both locally and regionally with declining bird populations. Partnering with the Aquidneck Land Trust here on the island, but also within the region with the Center for Northern Forest Research. And I'll just highlight a few of those things as we go along. Most of my courses involve some aspect of service, sometimes it's a volunteer opportunity, other times it's a course requirement, where in my conservation biology class, for example, students have been out uh, planting uh, doing grass or doing some trail restoration work. My ecology course right now is a requirement is, is working on some trail signage and educational materials for a, uh, the Equidneck Land Trust um, 
Sakana Greenway Trail, which runs about five miles from Portsmouth Down to Newport. And we've developed some study abroad courses to broaden our perspective in the sciences with this idea of stewardship. I've been organizing one course that goes to Scandinavia, to Denmark, to Sweden, to Iceland, to look at sustainable development, what those countries are doing, and try to apply that back home. And then with our biology majors, we are starting a course now where we'll be going this January to Belize to focus on tropical ecology to understand more about our, our global biological diversity and the problems that it faces. And then tying this into all my courses. So this principle of stewardship that echoes through all that I do at the university. And let me just highlight again some of these things in a little bit more detail. One, I want to just point out that the Sisters of Mercy have identified four critical areas of concern globally. One of those is this fundamental right to water, that all people should have access to clean, safe drinking water supplies. There are estimates that about 14,000 uh, children die every day in the world due to illnesses born from unsafe, untreated water. Uh, and then, then you turn your attention to our country, We'll happily spend a couple of dollars for municipal water from Atlanta that's just been purified, put into a bottle, and shipped to us. Um, we're we're providing what should be free to everybody. We're making it a commodity, and so that's that's a fundamental problem, and it's one that we can address ourselves, one we can address as a community, and, and as a scientist. I've looked into the aspect of why do we buy bottled water. Maybe we don't like our local water. Maybe our local water isn't safe. So I turned the students loose on this problem. And of course, that we call environmental quality, the students were asked to address this issue of what's wrong with our water. And they began to explore the local watershed issues. Two students in the lab coats on the left are <coughs> explaining to the audience here how we, including our current president, how we measure um, bacteria in water supplies. So this, this sample they're testing came from the Mayfair River, which is part of your drinking water supply. And they're looking at what the bacteria counts are, the phosphates and nitrates, trying to establish uh, critical guidelines for our water. We then are, are working on being able to report these results then to the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Environmental Management for Rhode Island to safeguard our water supply. So as scientists, we're at Salve, we are really uh, stepping in where the government has left the void in protecting our safe water and monitoring it on a weekly basis. Um, and all of that really ties into the future of our water supply and where is it going to come from. We base all of our water use and the water supply on the current climate, how much precipitation we get per year, and we know that the climate's changing. And again, here's another enormous problem. We wonder, well, what can we do about climate change? And we know the climate's going to change, and some areas are going to get intensely drier, and some areas are going to get intensely wetter. The climate is going to be changing. It has been changing, and it's going to change into the future. And for us in a low-lying sea level area, we are also concerned about sea level change. Uh, this is a map of uh, New York City in the 100-year flood zone as predicted by the end of the century so that this not, wouldn't be underwater by 2100, but if there were to be one of the 100-year floods, a big catastrophic flood, that's where the water level would rise to by 2100. So uh, you can envision what it would be like in Newport. I couldn't find a map of Newport of what that would look like. But you know, living on the coast, we, we were dealing with a major global problem that's going to affect us directly. Not only our drinking water, but how we live and where we live. And other people, of course, around the world are going to be feeling the pain far more than we will. So what can we do? Well, we can look at ourselves first. We can look in that mirror and we can say, well, where does my energy come from? I'm powering this laptop. We have the lights on in this room. And we can turn our attention to our energy supply. Your energy, when you flip on the switch here in this building or any place in this part of Rhode Island, the majority of the energy either comes from a coal burning power plant, about 12%, about 30% from natural gas, another 30% from uh, nuclear. And nuclear, in terms of global climate change, is relatively 
mean, um, but there are other sources as well. And there are alternatives, because it, where we live, we have the opportunity to flip the switch the other way if we want to. You can call National Grid and you can say, I want to have 100% green energy. And really, by literally, by sending in notice to do this, like I have at my own home, we have primarily what comes in right now is hydropower, uh, wind power, and solar power comes to my home. So these lights then, then become green. Okay, power becomes green. We've reduced that effect one by one. So what about other aspects? What about our courses? So I'll, I try to assess this impact that we have across the campus and I turn the students loose on this. And I, what I'm looking for are viable alternatives. What can we do as a campus? So what I've done in my course, this Bio 140 Humans in Their Environment, is I asked the students then, what can we do? Here are the global issues. You come up with a solution. You go out and measure it, figure out what the solutions are, we'll put a report together and turn it over to administration and see what can come out of this. We've done this from the library, we've done it different aspects of the campus, and slowly things are starting to change on the campus. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Here are two students. Allison did a study on looking at the computer labs. She measured how much energy would be involved in running the computer labs. She calculated what that would mean in carbon dioxide in terms of pounds of carbon dioxide per week. Turning that over for tons of carbon dioxide per academic year, coming out around 30 tons per year. Okay. Whereas uh, Brian was looking at the laptops, noticing a lot of students would leave their laptops running all night, wondering what that would be impact that would be measuring those impacts, calculating those impacts over to the carbon footprint coming out to about 16 tons of carbon dioxide per year. And then so okay, so that's what we're doing. Well what's the, what are the alternatives? Well, maybe choose computers that use less energy, using displays with less energy, turning off computers at night. Or maybe that switch I was talking about, maybe the campus could pull a switch and we could go towards more green sources coming to the university. It's going to cost a little more to do that. That's that economically viable part of our uh, sustainability statement. That's the, the tough part to figure out. But that's a choice that we can make. It's a choice that has to come from the students. Uh, on the other side, Paul here decided, well, you know, trees absorb carbon dioxide. We have all kinds of car our trees on campus. What if I went out and measured all the trees and figured out how much carbon dioxide uh, what Paul did is he actually, this would be the, the uh, biggest tree hunter on campus because he wrapped his arms around every tree to measure the size of all the major trees on campus. And uh, in case you didn't know, there are 1,468 trees on campus. And based on their size, Paul estimated that means those trees are absorbing about 862 tons of carbon dioxide each year. So all told for the entire class, we can measure our carbon footprint. We can recognize there are some things that are big, some things that are small, some things that are positive, and some things that are negative. If you want to tackle the big things first, it's got to be the cars and the commuting. It's got to be the natural gas and, the, and oil heating. But thank goodness for the trees, because they're absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide and tucking it away. That's what we can do on campus. We can learn about these topics, we can measure, quantify what's going on, and we can come up with some viable solutions. And maybe some of those bear some fruit. I studied birds, I don't study polar bears, but when I think about what's going on with climate change, and we think about the plight of things like polar bears, think about species that have already been pushed to the brink from other activities across the globe. And now with climate change, the, the, really the pressure's on and their numbers are going to be really impacted. What can we do? Well, I don't study polar bears, but I study birds. I study birds that have been, that are in decline, birds that have disappeared. I study them locally uh, in Vermont with students. I study them uh, locally here on the island. Uh, in the winter, students and I go out and we listen for owls, and owls are one of our top predators. We try to get a feeling for what's going on in these populations. So we can be concerned about biodiversity, we can be concerned about a global mass extinction of species, 
where we can turn our attention to what's in our backyard, what's right here, and get involved and do something about it. And so that's where my research lies uh, during the summer and during the academic year uh, with ecology. I point out that we have another aspect of biodiversity that's coming up very soon. The Environmental Club is active on campus and they're going to be hosting a workshop with Mystic Aquarium. One of the really interesting features of our local biodiversity are these marine mammals and some of the problems they run into. So here we are, right on the edge of the ocean, right next door to these marine mammals, and uh, we have an opportunity to help them. And, and um, one way in which we can do that is becoming what are called first responders for stranded marine mammals. And you can find out more about this on November 17th at 6 o'clock at Kazarski, where the environmental will be hosting this presentation from um, Mystic Aquarium. In my coursework, we try to go abroad. I, I mentioned Scandinavia to learn about sustainable development. We'll be going in January to Belize to learn about tropical systems. We'll be going to one of the largest jaguar preserves in the hemisphere to learn about the fate of the jaguar and other species. We'll spend some time on tropical islands looking at coral reef diversity and the plight of coral reefs and, and how they're being impacted by climate change and ocean acidification. Learning more about what's going on is one of the first steps and one of the great things you can do while you're here at the university is to learn more and then get involved in those local solutions. So, the take home message here then is get involved. We live in a beautiful place. There are enormous global problems going on, but there are things that you can do. I just highlighted a few of the things that I do, a few of the things I do with my students. There are a number of organizations locally that you can get involved with as interns, as volunteers. Clean Ocean Access does a beach cleanup each month. You just go to their website, go to their site, and go help them clean up the beaches. Great Neck Land Trust has a number of opportunities to get involved. We have a student there now who has an internship in their office. Nova Bird Sanctuary does a lot of environmental education. We have students who usually have an internship there each year. Uh, the Great Neck Island Watershed Council is doing the watershed monitoring, protecting our drinking water supply. Again, touching on the global issues locally, right here in your backyard. Save the Bay, fantastic nationally recognized organization that has done a tremendous job to clean up Narragansett Bay. I grew up here, I know what it used to be like, it's a lot cleaner than it used to be, but it's got, still has got a long way to go. <laughs> and uh, again, Mystic Aquarium, with their marine mammal first responder training that they have here for the campus. So I end there just say, you know, there are a number of global problems. There are a number of major issues that are out there. You have to become more aware of what they are, but you can't be overwhelmed to the point where you don't do anything. We have to hopefully be restless and get involved. And so um, thank you for having this gathering today. I know my colleagues and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.